thank you very much. Uh, and now we get to this evening's uh, annual debate for 2019 entitled The Future of Plant Science. So uh, this is the annual debate uh, arranged in association with the London Evolutionary Research Network, or LEARN, and will be chaired this evening by PhD student Karina Kern, uh, who's doing a, a PhD in genetics, evolution, and environment at UCL. Um, and she's also a scientific chair of the Clean Tech Challenge. And this is a, a global competition for students aimed at promoting innovative clean tech ideas and sponsored by the London Business School and UCL. Um, so the, the topic for this evening's debate, the future of plant science, um, is important because plant science has perhaps never been more relevant than now. We live in a demanding age where environmental change, along with increasing populations, demands for food, clothing, fiber, uh, shelter, all create pressures. And the question tonight is, what role does plant biology and plant science have to play in addressing these global problems? And what challenges do scientists working in this field currently face? Should the next generation of plant biologists be looking to revolutionize the current field? So these are the questions that our speakers are going to engage with this evening. I'm going to hand over the chair now to Karina um, and look forward to the, tonight's debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Shall I stand that side? Is that right? yeah. Thank you all for coming. And um, as we heard, so it's going to be a very exciting debate on plants. And there's a broad spectrum of plant biologists here today. So you're going to hear talks, and they're going to be short 10-minute talks, one after the other. And following that, we'll have a um, panel discussion where you can ask questions. So the first speaker is going to be Paul Kersey, who's deputy director of the Royal Botanic um, Gardens, and he works on bioinformatics and genomic databases. Um, following that, you'll hear from James Murray from Imperial College London, and he's gonna speak on biofuels and the structure and synthetic biology of photosynthesis. Um, after that, you'll have Hugh Pritchard, also from the Royal Botanic Gardens, and he's going to talk on comparative seed biology. Um, then you have Tolga Boskert, um, who's going to speak on plant immunity, and finally Peter Nixon, and his research is on various aspects of solar conversion by chloroplasts. So it's really about our future and the potential for plants to impact that. Hello, so at Kew Gardens, I'm responsible for genomics and bioinformatics, and so today I'm going to tell you about the future of bio plant sciences, genomics, genomics, and genomics. This is Fred Sanger, who developed the technologies that ultimately led the way to the genomic revolution. Wonderful little piece of English scientist understatement. Knowledge of sequences could contribute much to our understanding of living matter. Indeed, they could. And when I worked in the lab, we used the sort of equipment you see in the left-hand side of this screen. Today, there's been massive parallelization of sequencing technology and miniaturization. And we use tiny machines like the Oxford Nanopore, which can produce complete genomes in just a few hours from a tiny quantity of material. And this work has obviously allowed us to sequence complete genomes of organisms. The landmark paper was the human genome, but in some ways this is the most relevant slide which is in almost every talk I give, which shows how since the human genome was sequenced, the cost of generating genome sequence has fallen amazingly. This is a log scale on this graph, so what you can actually see is that straight line would represent the cost of generating a certain amount of sequence uh, halving every 18 months. And you can see the green line shows quite how spectacularly quickly costs have fallen, even beyond that level. And what this chart doesn't show is the radical developments in the last few years, which has seen a big improvement in the type of sequence we generate. So traditionally, we could only sequence very little bits of sequence, which are very hard to assemble into complete representations of the genomes of organisms. New technologies are producing much longer sequences and allowing us to get molecular level assemblies of chromosomes. 
So that's the introductory background. As I said, I'm going to argue today the future of plant science is genomics, genomics, genomics. In particular, I'm going to argue that the future of current plant science is genomics, that the future of future plant science is genomics, and also that the future of past plant science is genomics. And I'm going to do that by referencing some of the work which is going on in our rather splendid and lovely environment at Kew. So this is a slightly wordy slide, but it summarizes the strategic objectives of our science division at Kew, and I've highlighted the red words so you don't have to read them all. The goal is to document and conduct research into global plant and fungal diversity. And that boils down to four big questions. What plants and fungi occur? What are the drivers and processes that underpin their diversity? What diversity is under threat? And how do plants and fungi contribute to particular natural and man-made ecosystems to benefit the environment and humans? And genomics is fantastically relevant to all four of those questions because it can tell us what something is, it can allow us to define what the species is, it can allow us to identify things in the field. By studying how sequences differ, we can see how and why a species is different to or similar to other species, and that's relevant to taxonomy, evolution, and function. And it also allows us to quantify the composition of communities, habitats, and populations, see how these change over time, see the role that each species plays within its ecosystem. And this work is, all, the potential of genomics is already a really live thing in the work we're doing at Kew. In the PAFDOL project, we're trying to assemble a comprehensive taxonomy to the genus level of every flowering plant species by sequencing 350 conserved genes across all of plant life. Some accused scientists have been out in the field pioneering techniques that will identify what a plant is on the basis of its genome sequence without even needing to take a sample back to the lab. And my colleagues Mariam Rafiki and Richard Bugs are working on plant pathogen relationships, particularly in terms of a dreadful ash dieback uh, epidemic, looking at the genetic basis of resistance, sensitivity, and pathogenicity. So genomics is in one sense already the future of a science we're doing now at Q but it's also going to play an even bigger role as a future of the future through Q's participation in the audacious Earth by a Genome Project, of which we're founder members. So this is an incredibly ambitious project to sequence about one and a half million eukaryotic species, including probably the best part of all 400,000 vascular plant species. To put this into context, there are only about 2,500 species from all eukaryotes which have been sequenced so far, and under 400 plants. So we're looking at a thousand-fold increase in the number of species for which we hope to have reference quality genome sequence. But this will be an enormously beneficial thing for mankind and for scientific research. We can explore biological dark matter for human benefit, finding useful molecules for food, fuel, biocatalysts, pharmaceuticals, and so on. We can protect ecosystems by properly characterizing them, measuring the biodiversity in them, and also understanding the biodiversity, biodiversity we have in our ex situ collections to optimize strategies for reintroducing material into the wild. But in addition, we will accelerate scientific understanding across all domains by placing each focus of study within its full evolutionary context. And you might say, why do we need to fully sequence every species? Why not just sequence to the genus level? But the genus level, although it's a start, is not enough. The Astrologus genus, for example, has tremendous uh, diversity within it, 3,200 species. So there's an enormous amount to do, but nonetheless, at the moment, the sequencing technology is no longer the most difficult thing. More or less, with thousands of caveats, this is a solved problem. The real challenges will be in sorting out the information to deliver it to scientists in a way that they can mine and understand it, but also actually in assembling this vast quantity of biological material that we're going to need to put through the sequencer. And that's to some extent where Q comes in. My colleague Hugh, Hugh works here at the Millennium Seed Bank. It's the world's most biodiverse collection of seeds in the world. We have specimens from over 40,000 species, well-documented, ready to grow up and harvest DNA from. And although it's not going to give us all of the plants in the Earth by a genome project, I think it really has a major role to play in accelerating us through the start of that process. 
But I also said that I'm going to say that genomics is the future of past plant science, and it's very nice to be here today at the Linnaean Society. Q, of course, holds a huge debt to uh, Linnaeus. Linnaeus, of course, was the first person to begin the business of plant taxonomy and classification, and that's still something we do a lot of at Q. Indeed, a lot of Q scientists do a form of science which might still be recognizable to Linnaeus. They go out into biodiverse parts of the world. They discover new species never before seen by scientists. And they take specimens, they preserve them, they document them, they write them down, and then they store them in our rather lovely uh, Victorian purpose-built herbarium, uh, which in its own way is just as wonderful a building as our exotic glass houses outside. So this might seem a long way from the cutting-edge science of genomics, but the fact is that genomics has the potential to give a new lease of usefulness to our massive bioresources in our herbarium. We're really starting to think and develop a concept of a digital herbarium. And what does a digital herbarium mean? It means we have, in physical copy, the specimens. There's no, we're not getting rid of those. But we want to take the metadata, which describes where and when the specimens were captured and how they were growing, and store them in a database to make the specimens findable and searchable. We want to supplement that with accurate modern geolocation information from any new specimens coming in and climate data, and other data that is linked to the point and site of location. Pictures of how the plants grow in the field, the classical taxonomic descriptions, but in addition, the molecular characterization, the DNA sequence, and also metabolomics and other high-throughput technologies. Because at the end of the day, a sequence on its own doesn't tell you very much, and arguably a specimen on its own doesn't tell you very much. When you put them together, you can actually see not just what you have, but what it is at a fundamental genetic level, and correlate that with the time and location and the conditions in which it was collected. And together, that will make an absolutely fantastic resource that will make our digitized herbarium as relevant to 21st century science as it was back in the early 19th century when that lovely building was first built. So, short talk today, so I'm already on to the final slide. I really think that a lot of the future of plant science is going to involve molecular description at vast scale. We're going to take a wider range of material forever before and actually understand at a molecular level what makes it the way it is. And genomics is certainly going to be absolutely one of the leading technologies in that. But sequence on its own is fairly useless. We need to know what we've sequenced. We need reference sequences for reference specimens. And that means that our collections are still as important to science as they were 170 years ago. Okay, thank you. So thanks very much for the invitation. I feel I've been invited on false pretenses because I think I am going to talk about biofuels, but only a little bit. Um, so this is me and my group um, work at Imperial College, and this is us at Kew Gardens on our annual outing. <laughs> so, <laughs> short um, so I work on photosynthesis, which um, and I, we look at the essentials in cyanobacteria, which are free-living bacteria, and they can be grown in large ponds, and you can eat these. I don't think they taste very nice, but they, they're high in protein and low in fat. Um, these were captured by uh, eukaryotes and became chloroplasts, but the essentials of photosynthesis are still all the same, so we can study them in cyanobacteria, and it's all applicable to plants. Um, we can split the essentials of photosynthesis into two conceptual parts, the light reactions, so dependent on light. Uh, this is the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll, so this is uh, the red peak of chlorophyll, so you capture red photons and use them to drive this reaction. It's a lot of reactions, but the first one is the oxidation of water to oxygen. So oxygen is the waste product, so all the atmosphere that we're breathing. Uh, if you take a breath, that's about a litre of air. And I worked out once that um, the next protein I'm going to talk about, uh, about 13 billion of them died to give you that oxygen. Um, <clears throat> so oxygen is the waste product. Uh, the real product is electrons. And those are then used to reduce in the dark or light independent reactions carbon dioxide uh, to sugars. So all the organic carbon that we see, all this wood, has come through this process of carbon fixation. Uh, so the water oxidation reaction is done by 
this big complex, the structure of which was solved at Imperial College earlier this millennium. Um, it's about 20 protein subunits binding chlorophyll uh, and all sorts of other cofactors in a membrane. And by protein standards, it's very complicated. Um, and this is the reaction that uses four photons of light to oxidize water to oxygen. Uh, it does this at room temperature at standard pressure. Um, without expensive metal catalysts, it just uses manganese. Uh, so chemists would like to be able to do what photosystem two does, just in leaves, uh, to, to make oxygen and then take these electrons from it. Um, so that's the light reactions. Um, those electrons are put onto carbon dioxide. Um, the carbon fixing enzyme is called Rubisco, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. So photosystem two is the king of the light reactions. This is the king of the dark reactions or light independent reactions. So most of the soluble protein in a leaf is Rubisco. So if you eat a lettuce, all of the protein that you're getting is Rubisco. So if you separate out these proteins on a gel, there's a big fat band, which is the Rubisco large subunit. And there is about 10 kilograms per person on Earth of Rubisco. So in my work, I've used a few milligrams, so much less than my share. Um, <clears throat> but by, by protein standards, it's a very abundant protein. Um, so photosystem two is only absorbing the red light. The green light is transmitted. That's why plants are green. Um, Rubisco also has a big inefficiency, so it will fix carbon dioxide and make sugars, um, but it also has a wasteful side reaction. It will instead react with oxygen and do this process called photorespiration, which consumes energy. So this is, this is the tick, we want this, but 30% of the time it does this reaction, which is bad. So this is so the single biggest loss step in photosynthesis, so about 30% um, of the sunlight captured by plants is wasted through this reaction. So um, that's the biggest loss step, but there are others. So we wrote a paper where we looked at all the different loss steps in photosynthesis. And we worked out that if you have 100% of the photons hitting a field, at best, 5% of that energy ends up in the biomass. And that's a thermodynamic limit. So that's a 5% at best. Really, it's probably closer to 1% for a very productive plant like sugarcane. Um, so plant photosynthesis is very inefficient. Um, it's wonderful, but it's not capturing all of the energy. Um, <clears throat> and this is a problem, because in the coming years, we need to do more with less. Um, so in 2010, there, this is a football field. This is how much um, agricultural land there is per person. In 2050, there'll be more people, so less land per person and they will want to be fed better quality food. Um, so yeah, we need to increase photosynthetic productivity for crops. So this is a slide which shows a similar thing. This is projected increases in crop productivity uh, with the solid line, and the blue line is the actual what, what is required. So just the linear increases that we've seen so far, um, if they continue, that won't be enough. So. This is from plant breeding and agronomy. It's thought that we could maybe increase the level to what we need through um, improving photosynthesis. Um, so we need to improve photosynthesis because we need to eat. Um, but I now invoke the wisdom of Marx. That's Groucho, not Karl. Whatever it is, I'm against it um, for biofuels. So this is oil palms. So palm oil, we're constantly told, is bad. Um, because it's environmentally destructive, but it's very, very productive. So a year, um, in a year, a hectare will give you 5,000 kilograms of oil, of biodiesel, which is about the same as 31 barrels of oil, which is enough oil for three people in the UK. Uh, given this productivity, uh, to feed, to make this amount of oil for the UK, you would need 10 times the area of Wales, or roughly cover all of the UK in oil palms at this high level of productivity, which is basically not going to work. Um, so there's not enough land on Earth to provide space to grow the plants we would need to provide the biofuel that we would need to power our civilization. 
So we need to incre increase photosynthetic productivity, but biofuels are not going to work. Um, so this is a summary of what I've just said. We need to improve photosynthesis. Um, because photosynthesis is conserved, we're not going to be able to breed better, so we will need genetic modification. So that's controversial, maybe. Uh, biofuels are going to be not useful at scale either. So um, that's another controversial statement. Um, and if you know what BEX is, that's biofuels squared in terms of fantasy. Uh, that's burning biofuels and then storing the carbon. That's even, that's never going to work. So I'll stop there. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, it's, uh, I should stand here. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and to support the LERN uh, as well as the Linnaean Society. And I'm Hugh Pritchard and my co-author is Danny Ballesteros, uh, who's sadly not with us uh, this evening. And we are both comparative seed biologists at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q at Wakehurst Place. Uh, and I'm not talking about comparative seed biology per se, but plant cryobiotechnology. Um, and that is certainly one component of the future of plant sciences at Kew. I suspect that you haven't heard of the term cryobiotechnology. Uh, I used it first in 2015 in a review of uh, the preservation opportunities for orchid diversity. Of course, uh, a very attractive family of 25, uh, 26, 27,000 uh, species. Um, uh, examples here of Papyopidilum henryanum from China, China Cattleya dowiana from uh, Panama and Costa Rica. And what we did was to look at uh, the different tissues that could be used uh, for preservation. Uh, the family is at risk of extinction um, to the tune of around 20% of the species. And what we find is that cryobiotechnology can be applied to uh, seeds, or, I mean already 60 uh, different species, to uh, pollen, also desiccation tolerant, uh, 10 species, uh, to germinating seeds which convert to protocorn-like bodies that can be used in horticulture to, uh, for clonal re reproduction, uh, for fungal symbionts as well, uh, and then for shoot tips, culture cells and rhizomes, all of which are, are, are cells in vitro, uh, can be used as a basis of clonal reproduction uh, of interest to the horticultural trade. Now, uh, the term cryobiotechnology seems to have attracted some attention because I know that from all of my publications, it's received the most reads in ResearchGate, more than 1,200 reads uh, in just three years. So there's something about the modernizing of the science uh, which I hope will attract uh, uh, younger scientists to, to this area. It was also the case that I started to notice that the USDA scientists and scientists in China were using the term cryobiotechnology and I thought it was appropriate to actually formally define it, which I've done at the end of last year. Now, biotechnology is uh, normally, if you look at OECD and CBD definitions, related to um, uh, transformed plants, and that's certainly not our objective uh, at Kew. I prefer a definition around biotechnology of the American Chemical Society, uh, and, and uh, modernizing, as it were, or using those phrases, cryobiotechnology is the use of modern technologies to understand the response of biological systems to low temperature environments, whether natural or imposed, leading to production of knowledge, goods, and services, including the cryopreservation of organisms, cells, and tissues for use by industry, agriculture, medicine, and conservation. So we have the concept of the drive for, for greater knowledge and the application and transfer of that knowledge to goods and services. We can break down cryobiotechnology to three areas, the natural processes, um, or indeed imposed stresses, uh, for which a, a greater understanding of ecology is valuable in terms of adaptation and resilience, uh, overwintering phenomena, uh, including uh, supercooling. A second area of technology development uh, around the omics or model systems, even using Arabidopsis, uh, the application of cryotherapy to uh, kill viruses in, in plant tissues, the design of cryopreservation systems, and structural biology. And structural biology is important in terms of the uh, imposition of a stable state on uh, dehydration and cooling of, of your system. What's shown here is a molecular arrangement for an amorphous solid, and candy is a good example of that. So when we preserve uh, plant cell systems, we're trying to induce a sort of candy-like form of structural stability. And then finally, in terms of services, the applied cryopreservation area 
is, is primarily towards the banking uh, of cells for agriculture, uh, industry and medicine and, and conservation. And that's usually in liquid nitrogen or in the vapor phase, so something in the region of minus 160 degrees centigrade to minus 196 degrees centigrade. Now, uh, this is a sort of new area for, for Q. Our commitment to plant preservation has been mainly through the Millennium Seed Bank project and through the first phase, 1997-2000, we banked most of the UK flora. Uh, phase two uh, through to 2010, conserved 10% of the world's flora. By an earlier estimate, uh, that would be 24,200 uh, species. It would be at least uh, 30,000 species now. Um, all of this banking is at minus 20. And phase three that we're currently in, as Paul's just mentioned, we've got somewhere in the region of 40,000 species banked uh, as seed. Now, including crop wilds relatives and uh, UK trees. So uh, an initiative over the last five years is to get multiple accessions of CWR, working in collaboration with the Crop Trust, particularly 26 uh, gene pools of the 64 um, species and, and clusters of species listed on the International Treaty for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, and also as support of the People's Postcode Lottery, the preservation of 60 species of UK trees, in fact, more than 10 million seeds. So this is all banking at minus 20 degrees centigrade. The basic method is to, to collect at the point of natural dispersal, to dry at 15% RH, 15 degrees centigrade, to clean by hand, to check the purity using X-ray of a subsample, uh, to transfer the dry seeds to containers that can seal that dryness in, move the container to minus 20 degrees centigrade and check for viability uh, every 10 years through a germination test. Now, an interesting feature about uh, seed banks is whilst we would want the seeds to live uh, indefinitely, they don't. And a very good example of that uh, is the dry seed stored in the United States Department of Agriculture gene bank at Fort Collins. So this is a co-plot of P50, so the half-life. For 276 crops, it's about uh, 40,000 accessions were checked, and it's, the, the seeds were held initially at five degrees uh, for about 10 degrees, and then when they improved their facilities there, transferred to minus 18 degrees centigrade. But the important thing here is that there is a span of lifespan, or a spread of lifespan, which is two orders of magnitude. And what it means is that half of these species produce seed lots on the right-hand side that have P50s less than 50 years, and only a fifth of the, the, the species are producing seed lots with lifespans more than, more than uh, 100 years. Uh, and we have evidence from our own uh, work at Kew in the Millennium Seed Bank that about 25% uh, of, of collections that were analyzed from uh, nearly 50 families uh, in, a, in a publication in 2009, that there was significant drop in viability after just 20 years for that subset uh, of the collections. So the issue there is whether minus 20 degrees centigrade is sufficiently cold to maintain the viability uh, of the seeds. And uh, the attraction of liquid nitrogen crop preservation is that in dropping the temperature, we would seek to en en enable an enhancement of lifespan by one order of magnitude. So we have short lifespans less than 10 years. We're pushing them towards 50 years before the need uh, or towards that before regeneration. Now, cryopreservation, you probably have heard as a, as a sort of discipline, um, but it's not new. And I can take you back to the 19th century. So, William Turner Thurston uh, Dyer was the third director of Kew, and he was in uh, collaboration with James Dewar at the Royal Institution. You see the uh, letter here from the Kew archive from the 22nd of July, 1899. And um, it, it says, by Professor Dewar's uh, instruction, I am sending here with the seeds which have been exposed to liquid hydrogen. Dewar was the innovator of the production of uh, liquid uh, hydrogen at minus 250 degrees centigrade. And then from the memoranda in the archive of Q from the 4th of August, 1899, we have the germination data for pea, for marrow, and for mustard. Um, for pea and marrow, germination was, was, was fine, was complete, but for mustard and oil seed, there was an indication even then that uh, deep cooling uh, can be a problem for some oil seeds, and it's still the case today. In fact, even storage at minus 20 can be a problem. So what we have learned over the last few years about um, enhancing lifespan in biological samples is really around the biophysics of preservation. And um, the best way to describe that is the dependence of the glass transition on the water content of the sample. And that's this, this line here. And if you either uh, increase the moisture content of a sample or the temperature, then you accelerate the rate of aging of this dry system. For conventional banking, we at 15 degrees centigrade then dry to about 5% moisture content. 
below the line into the glassy state, that amorphous solid. And then we cool to minus 20, so we sort of reinforce the glassy state. It's, it's pretty stable. We know that those seeds generally easily transfer to cryopreservation temperatures. It's slightly different when we're dealing with uh, hydrated tissues, such as shoot tips or somatic embryos or dormant buds or, or root cells, leaf cells, uh, or indeed the recalcitrant seeds, desiccation-sensitive seeds of, of tropical and temperate trees. Then we want to partially dry, which we can do in a flow of air or chemically, in fact, to about 20% moisture content, and then cool rapidly into the glassy state. And you can see immediately the problem that below zero degrees centigrade, there's a high risk of ice formation. And so we're very interested in the use of chemical protectants to reduce both nucleation and uh, ice crystal growth. So those are the principles of preservation. Uh, we have um, recently um, developed a sort of conceptual framework uh, for the work that we want to do in the future called the Q cryosphere. And this conceptual space is just mapped out with a series of images here from increasing tissue complexities from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. So we're starting with uh, single cells, spores uh, of ferns, and single cells mainly of, of pollen, sometimes tetrads. And then further down, we come through multiple uh, tissues uh, uh, or complex tissue shoot tips and somatic embryos. And at the bottom of the slide, we have the, the multi-tissue uh, organisms, as it were, uh, the seeds uh, of orthodox or desiccation toroid or recalcitrant. And as we come diagonally from top right to bottom left, uh, we're increasing the tissue complexity and increasing the structural problems in terms of stresses and strains as we take these systems through drying and deep cooling. And the consequence of that is that um, within our cryosphere science at Kew, what we need to do is to connect a whole range of different disciplines around biotechnology, around the ecology of, uh, of uh, the environment, around low temperature science, cryobiology, around the biochemistry uh, of processes, oxidative or cryoprotection, certainly around structural biology and, and stability, in other words, biophysics, and then the recovery of the material in vitro uh, as well. So the future for us at Q in terms of plant preservation is we will continue to do a lot more with the Millennium Seed Bank uh, at minus 20 degrees centigrade. We were also expanding our, our interest in the application of the, the cryosphere as a conceptual and physical space. Uh, so a key component, in fact, of Q's new collection strategy through to 2028. And cryobiotechnology, this combination of disciplines, allows us to open up the potential preservation of all tissues of all plant species. So we're going to focus more on the embryos of recalcitrant seeds of trees, particularly those uh, um, from the tropics, and threatened species as well. And then finally work more on the comparative structural biology of stress and survival. And I just showed the bottom right-hand side uh, a micro-CT uh, scan uh, developed with Natural History Museum. Uh, I didn't want to leave you without some comment about evolution uh, in this meeting, but Zane in 2014 um, published a paper suggesting there were three key steps in the um, enablement of angiosperms to radiate into to freezing environments or to survive in freezing environments. And one of them is the dimensions of the conducting vessels. And so we started to use micro-CT to look at the internal micromorphology of the embryonic axis of seeds, uh, thanks to the Garfield Western Foundation and to DEFRA as the main funders of this work. Okay, so in my group at Imperial College, we are uh, working on uh, the molecular dialogue between the plants and the parasites. And when I say the parasites, we focus on a specific group called the filamentous microbes. So these are uh, basically fungi and fungus-like organisms uh, called oomycetes. And uh, as uh, uh, James was highlighting, by 2050, we are expected to have 9 billion people. And to feed this many people, we need like 50% productive increase in our agricultural productivity. So at the moment, we have 7 billion on this planet, and 1 billion people are under the limit of starvation. And that means one out of every seven people. Uh, in, for instance, in developing countries, we have many uh, People are dying from starvation and related diseases, whereas if you come to the developed countries like UK, you don't see people starving to death, but what you can observe every year is a gradual increase in the food prices. 
So plant disease have a major role in uh, preventing the agricultural productivity. And in 2010, in the issue of this science, they listed seven most dangerous ones, and they were two of, there are two of them in the, were bacterial pathogens, which I didn't include here. And these are all fungus, uh, fungi, and also one oomycete pathogen that we work in my lab here. So this was in 2010, but now we even have more problems. So in bananas, we have a new fungal trait called the Panama disease. And we also have wheat blast is a, one of the major threats to our global food, food security. So every year we are having new uh, uh, emerging pathogens that uh, really uh, challenges uh, the agricultural productivity. So the uh, pathogen we work with is an omycet pathogen. It's a fungus-like organism called Phytophthora infestans. The name originates from the Greek language, which means the plant killer or plant destroyer. And you can nicely see why it, they give that name to this parasite, because this is a farm of uh, tomatoes, and you can see that they forgot to spray this with the chemicals, and it really behaves like a herbicide. It completely destroys the, the, the field. And the only way we can grow potatoes and tomatoes uh, uh, nowadays is that we have to constantly, repeatedly uh, spray them with the chemicals. Otherwise, it will just destroy all the, all the, all the crops. So it has a great economical impact, so more than uh, $7 billion is lost to, to, to this parasite. And it has great capacity to rapidly overcome the both chemical and genetic resistance. And just two years ago, a new strain of Phytophthora arrived in the UK, which is known to be tolerant to most of the chemicals that we use. So the problem is getting more and more uh, worse uh, every day. So Phytophthora is really good at uh, infecting the plants because it can nicely penetrate into the plant tissue. And it shows this uh, hyphal uh, growth on top of the plant. It penetrates through the tissue and forms these structures called hostorium. So these are hyphal extensions that they penetrate into the plant cell. And these are very important because through these structures, they basically feed on the plants. And they also secrete agents that we call effectors that go inside the plant cell and undermine the plant immunity. So this is how they basically work at the molecular level. So they convince the plant that everything is fine, so the plant uh, cannot protect itself, and the parasites start uh, leaching the nutrients. So in a successful case of infection, here we have our parasite, which is labeled with a red fluorescence protein. So I labeled the uh, cell borders here for you with the dotted line. And you can see that this parasite successfully colonized this plant, and it's also penetrating to the neighbor cell. So this is the case of the successful infection. When it is unsuccessful, when plants can detect and uh, mount defenses effectively, what you can see here is this parasite is trapped within this cell, and it cannot move to the neighbor cell. And what you also see is some sort of red fluorescent leaking from this pathogen is basically the, the pathogen is dying, it's kind of bleeding into the plant cell, the red fluorescence protein is leaking into the plant cell. So both the plant cell and the parasite, parasite die, it's a mini sacrifice from the plant cell, but it just basically protects the rest of the plant. And uh, if we have this system, why the plants are susceptible, uh, to these parasites is the question, right? So basically, plants have everything to defend themselves. So if I give you this parasite, and you go to the uh, Hyde Park and try to infect these plants, you will not be able to infect any of these plants because all the plants have a really uh, good uh, defense system. The only problem is they cannot sense, this, sense the pathogen because the pathogens uh, use strategies to become stealth, to avoid recognition, therefore, if the plants do not have the correct receptor or sensors to, to sense them, then they will not be able to protect themselves. So this is how it works at the molecular level. If it's a bacteria or a filamentous microbe, they secrete virulence factors. So these are agents that go inside the plant tissue and the plant cells. They target the, the plant components and alter these processes in favor of the parasite, and they help the microbe to colonize the, the host, and they uptake the nutrients. And in this case, you will have a happy pathogen that is infecting the plant. But uh, when they are detected by intracellular or surface localized immune receptors, the plants will uh, undergo a programmed cell death that will have a, a mini sacrifice here. The plant cell dies, the parasite also dies, but the parasite cannot colonize the plant cell. So to counteract these processes, what we are really doing is we are following these virulence factors. We try to understand what they target, 
we find their targets, and one idea is if we know what they are targeting, we can genetically modify this target to keep them still functional, but that cannot be targeted by this parasite. So that is one strategy we are, we are after. Another strategy is there are immune receptors. Obviously, parasites are evolving to avoid them, evade them. One strategy is that you can find them in the wild resources, like the wild relatives of the crops, and in integrate them into the plants, the crops. Or you can, we can generate synthetic receptors that are more powerful and that are more synthesized, sen sensitized to sense these, these affected proteins. So I'd like to give an example from our research. So we discovered that one of the agents these parasites secretes is activates a process inside the plants that is used to counteract starvation. So when our bodies and plant cells, they starve, they uh, activate a process called autophagy. It's kind of a self-eating process where unnecessary com components are trapped in the vesicles and they are degraded. And the processed components can be used as an energy source for the essential biochemical reactions. And looks like the parasite has evolved a molecule that is mimicking the plant processes to activate this process. And they form these uh, autophagic compartments, these vesicles. Potentially, we believe that they are full of nutrients, but they don't end up serving the plant. They were targeted to this interface, and potentially the parasite is uh, sucking them up uh, to, to grow and uh, colonize the next round of plants. So this is how it looks like in the real life. I labeled you the cell borders again with the dotted line here. And in the red color here, we have the structure hostorium. And in the green color, we have our vesicles, these starvation-induced compartments that are targeted to this interface. So what we, is happening, we believe here, is that the parasite is activating them and they, it's uh, uh, uptaking them for, as a nutrient resource. And uh, we thought, OK, if this is the case, if we can block this pathway, maybe we can have some sort of a resistance because the parasite will not be able to feed effectively. And indeed, our preliminary data shows that if we can block this pathway, the parasite is not uh, growing well uh, as, as the, in the normal conditions. So another thing I would like to highlight from our research is that in the past, what we know that, as James has shown, that chloroplasts are very, so used to be free-living bacteria, which were internalized into the plant cells as a result of a symbiotic event. And they now uh, do the photosynthesis and produce the sugars uh, for us, uh, for the plant cell and for basically everyone on this planet. And what uh, was discovered is that when there is immune activation, these chloroplasts shut down photosynthesis. And they start producing antimicrobial compounds. In addition to that, there was remarkable observation that upon activation of this immune system, they form these tubular extensions that sometimes extend and uh, uh, grab around the uh, plant nucleus. So the idea here is what we believe. They might be signaling some, uh, sending some molecules to the plant nucleus to activate the, the plant immunity. To follow up that in my lab, what we have discovered is chloroplasts are normally randomly distributed around the plant cells, and they don't uh, form these networks, but upon Pathogen activation, when the parasite infects and the plant senses through its surface receptors, they form like a network and they immediately move towards the site of infection. And they look like they are collaborating with each other to contract this in, in infection. And when we block this pathway again, we can see that the plants are more susceptible, indicating that this is a defense-related uh, process, that these, uh, these guys are not only doing photosynthesis, but they are also contributing to the plant immunity. And I would like to show you a, a real-time video we obtained in my lab. So here, there is one hostorium, this uh, uh, finger-like structure here. There's another one, another one another one here. I'll just start you the movie. And there are some vesicles we labeled that are moving around, and it's still colored chloroplasts are approaching to this uh, uh, hostorium. As you can see, that they are really actively jumping on these uh, penetration sites. And we also did some 3D imaging. So here in this uh, magenta color, you can see the parasite labeled, and you can see this finger-shaped structures that penetrates the plant cells. And in the yellow color, we, have, we, we just look at the chloroplasts, we label them. And normally they are uh, in the uninfected regions, they, are, uh, they don't form these networks. But what you can see here, when we have an infection, infected cells, they form these tubular extensions, these networks, and they wrap around these hostorial structures. And they can extend from one hostorium to another. Probably they are uh, communicating with each other. So there is another example of video here. We have a hostorium here. The 
penetration uh, from the parasite to uptake the plant nutrients and uh, control the plant cell. And you can see a network of chloroplasts uh, that accumulate around it. And they, in this channel here, there's a magnified version of, of the chloroplast. So I start the movie. You can see that they are highly dynamic and they are moving around it and they en engulf it with these tubular extensions. So we think they are both chemically and physically fighting against the infection to prevent the penetration of these microbes and gain access to the plant nutrients. Because in the end, uh, these, uh, these organelles were used to be free living bacteria. They were internalized by the plant cell. So plant cell is their home. So if the plant is destroyed, these guys are also destroyed. So they are probably ancient defense systems are co-opted by the plants, and together they fight against these infections. And in my lab, this, uh, we're trying to understand these processes, the basic processes, and uh, the idea is if we can understand quite well how these work, we can design synthetic immune receptors to act against the parasite, we can modulate the pathogen-targeted pathways in favor of the plants, and we can do genome editing of susceptibility genes. I didn't go into the details of this, but in plants, there are also ge genes that lead to the susceptibility. So these are probably genes essential for the lifestyle of the plant, but they are exploited by the pathogens, then they use it for, for, the, for colonizing the plants. So this is my group at Imperial, and some of the guys, Kieran, Alex, Yasin, and Zach are here. Uh, so Thanks for listening. All right. All right well, th first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation to contribute to tonight's uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Peter Nixon from Imperial College. I'm, in fact, I'm a I, my office is very close to James's, and I'm, my talk is going to follow on from his presentation. And I'm, I want to discuss ways in which researchers are trying to enhance photosynthesis, and then I'll just at the end touch on some of the ways forward, I think, that's going to, that's, that photosynthetic organisms are going to be used, uh, not just for food, but also for other biotechnological purposes. Um, and as... Um, uh, as James, uh, oh dear, <laughs> I think I've, I've got the wrong pointer here. Does it go forward with the, oh, it's the, I've got your pointer. Right, and as James mentioned, uh, photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis is a, an absolutely vital process for plants to grow. And it's attracted many people, not just plant biologists, but plant biochemists, physicists throughout the ages to understand this very important process, which is how, oh dear, <laughs> which is how, um, which is how, how sunlight is captured and used to break down water molecules to release oxygen and produce hydrogen or reducing equivalents, which are then consumed in the fixation of carbon dioxide into carbohydrate. And this is used for, plant, for the production of plant biomass, but also used as, as, a, as a fuel uh, during the night. And James mentioned and emphasized the fact that plant photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis, is extremely inefficient. So plants have not evolved for efficiency. They've evolved to, be, to survive, to be robust, to withstand the environmental stresses and, uh, that, they're, that they grow under. And James mentioned that, um, that the, uh, the photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast. And there are two aspects of photosynthesis, the, the light reactions, where the photons of light are absorbed by the pigments within the photosynthetic apparatus and then converted into chemical energy. And then and that takes place in the thylakoid membrane. And then in the stroma, the soluble phase, the chemical energy and the, uh, and the reducing equivalents are used to fix carbon dioxide into um, sugar and starch uh, using Rubisco, the enzyme James touched upon. Um, and there are now attempts by researchers around the world to improve the efficiency of photosynthesis by targeting both the light reactions as well as the, uh, the dark reactions. And I'm just going to touch upon some examples uh, of the type of approaches. Some of them are quite fanciful, but very interesting. And I'll, I'll also touch upon one example where it has worked. There is hope. It does work. You can re-engineer photosynthesis to improve it. Um, and it's based on the fact that photosynthesis has evolved not for efficiency, but to be robust. So let's take that example where photosynthesis can be enhanced. And it was a recent paper, and it's really caused, the f caused excitement in the field. 
and gave us hope that this could be a, a plausible strategy. And let's look, first of all, at what happens when plants are not grown in growth chambers in the laboratory, but instead are grown in the field. And what I'm showing you here is light intensity, photosynthetically active radiation on the number of photons per square meter per second on the y-axis, and then the time during the day. Now, in the, in the, on the bottom here is the sort of illumination conditions we find in a growth chamber. We, maintain, we grow plants under constant illumination, so they grow at a certain rate, they acclimate to that particular circumstance, that environment. But in the field, you can see that the intensity goes up during the day to midday, where you have most light, comes down to in the evening. But on top of that, you've got these fluctuations, these large fluctuations in light intensity. But it could be a cloud passing and so on. So the, the, the plants have to survive under conditions where not only the, there's not constant illumination, but there's sudden bursts of bright illumination followed by dark, dark illumination. And so plants have evolved mechanisms to withstand this change in illumination. And one of the interesting mechanisms is to switch off photosynthesis. So if a plant is growing or exposed to light, when there's a sudden burst of light, increase in light intensity, there are mechanisms in place to switch off photosynthesis. So the light is not used for photosynthesis, but it's dissipated as heat. It's a way of, of allowing the plant to survive this sudden change in intensity. Now, the problem with this process, this regulation, is it's rather like a car accelerating and braking. The plant breaks to slow down photosynthesis, but then when the light intensity comes back to the right level, it has to accelerate again to restart photosynthesis, and it takes time. So there's a lag period while, while the plant tries to regain or restart photosynthesis. And colleagues, um, uh, Steve Long and colleagues, showed that they could manipulate plants to reduce this lag period so that when the light intensity reduced, photosynthesis could start up quicker than normal. And that saving in time, that saving in time whereby you restart photosynthesis, had a big impact on plant growth because now plants were photosynthesizing for longer during the day. They weren't switched off in sleep mode. And in their experiments, they showed that the productivity of their plants, tobacco plants, increased by 15%. So this is one mutant plant, if you like, engineered plant, that exploiting this regulation that's in place because the plant has to withstand and is very conservative in its behavior, has to withstand these illumination conditions. By um, manipulating that, you could get more biomass production. So this one plant showed, yes, you can enhance photosynthesis. It is a, it is a possibility. Now, the other, the other examples I'm going to focus on, uh, and these are the sort of approaches that I'm using in my lab, is to learn from the diversity of photosynthetic organisms that are out there in nature. I mean, we're, we've, we've been talking about plants in the main, but there are other relatives, and we've just discussed it um, in the last talk, there are simpler single-celled organisms that do oxygenic photosynthesis, the cyanobacteria, prokaryotes, and the unicellular algae. They do photosynthesis like plants, but they have specific adaptations to enable them to photosynthesize and thrive in the particular environment that they live. Um, and uh, there have been many attempts now, or there are attempts, to try and introduce some of those adaptations found in cyanobacteria and algae into plants to try and boost photosynthesis. So one example we're working on at Imperial, together with James actually, is to change or uh, add or change the pigment content of plants. Now, in certain cyanobacteria that are found in stromatolites, shown over here, they, they use or they synthesize a, type, a new type of chlorophyll called chlorophyll F. It's very similar to the chlorophyll A's and B's you find in plants and algae. But this chlorophyll F molecule absorbs slightly outside the visible range of the spectrum. So over here, between 400 and 700 nanometers, this is where plants will absorb light. The cyanobacterium, chlorophyll F, absorbs in the near infrared, just shifted to the red. So the idea here is if we could make plants produce chlorophyll F, they will be able to absorb outside the normal range of the solar spectrum, the visible spectrum, and therefore be able to harvest more of the solar energy. And, the, and there was a pioneering and a very important paper by Don Bryant that showed that the enzyme thought to be responsible for making chlorophyll F, it's just a single gene that's responsible. So by inserting this gene into plants, we hope to produce chlorophyll F and thereby extend the, the, the spectrum of the light that it can absorb, the photosynthetic apparatus can absorb. Um, another problem uh, for plants 
uh, again, it's, not, it's, it's their ability to withstand stress, light stress. So bright light inhibits photosynthesis. So here's an example of, of just light intensity, uh, photosynthetic activity, dim light, you increase photosynthesis, you ramp up the light intensity, it saturates. But as you end, end up providing too much light, the maximal rate of photosynthesis declines, and this is called photoinhibition. And this is because the photosynthetic apparatus and the plant cannot absorb so much light energy, which causes the production of reactive oxygen species, and it leads to irreversible damage to the photosynthetic apparatus, essentially killing off the complexes, the proteins involved in converting solar energy into chemical energy, thereby leading to a decline in photosynthesis. And clearly, if you can understand more about the processes involved in photoinhibition, understand more about how the plant can survive this process, we can engineer plants to hopefully withstand higher light intensities. And uh, one particular aspect of photoinhibition, and I won't go into the details, is damage to the photosystem 2 complex that James described. It's very vulnerable to photoinhibition, this light damage, and there's a very elaborate pathway or series of reactions whereby the damaged proteins are removed and newly synthesized proteins are, are reinserted to, to restore the activity. And classical biochemical and mutagenesis studies has identified many of the factors involved in this photosystem to repair process, and we hope by manipulating the, the levels of these proteins in the plants, we we're able to create plants that are able to withstand the damaging effects of light by in, in having a more superpowered repair cycle. Now, in terms, I just want to touch upon um, if, um, um, attempts to improve the dark reactions. There are many different types of approaches you could use, but the one that, uh, that and James touched upon this, the, the, the key enzyme involved in carbon dioxide fixation is the uh, Rubisco enzyme that fixes carbon dioxide. And he mentioned there are problems with Rubisco because besides doing the productive carboxylase reaction, it has a wasteful oxygenase reaction. Uh, and the reason is because there's, there's, there's too much oxygen present in the chloroplast when plants are, are under, under drought stress, and that competes with the carbon dioxide for a reaction with the enzyme. Now, if, if we look at, instead at what happens in cyanobacteria, the more primitive cyanobacteria, they overcome this wasteful oxygenase reaction by elevating the levels of carbon dioxide in the cell. And they do this by synthesizing a special microcompartment in the cell called a carboxysome. There are two, this, these are two different types of cyanobacteria. The carboxysome is rather like a, the, the, a virus, if you, if you like. It's got, a, it's, it's, it's got uh, shell proteins, and inside this particular microcompartment is located the Rubisco enzyme, and uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide or bicarbonate is pumped into the cell, and it enters into the carboxysome and generates carbon dioxide, which reacts with Rubisco in the carbon dioxide fixation reaction. So, Cyanobacteria have learnt or evolved to overcome or promote the carboxylation reaction by making this microcompartment. And so there are many groups out there who are trying to do the same thing with plants. They want to make chloroplasts produce a microcompartment like that observed in cyanobacteria to hopefully boost the carboxylation reaction. And in fact, there, are, there is great promise in this approach. People have got to the stage of inserting the genes encoding the cyanobacterial proteins into chloroplasts and getting the formation of something that looks like a microcompartment. Um, and so they're on the way to actually getting to a stage where perhaps they can um, have a fully active and functional uh, carboxysome. Now, um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but so, so over, overall, I would say uh, the future of plant, plant biology or plant science, very rosy. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? It's very rosy. I urge all young scientists out there and older scientists, interested people, to take a fresh look at plant biology. It's, it, there's a lot of interesting things going on, not only genomics, but all the way through synthetic biology and through the, to, to the creation of new plants that uh, can grow better, can do things. And one of the things that we're interested in is exploiting photosynthesis to produce c chemicals in a green way. And um, the, the, the organism we're using, or the type of organism, cyanobacteria, as I've just explained to you, they grow using sunlight, carbon dioxide, water. They don't need fossil fuels. They, they, they can grow without producing carbon dioxide. In fact, they take up carbon dioxide. And so there's a lot of work in the, in the world at the moment 
trying to produce so-called solar biorefineries using cyanobacteria or microalgae to produce valuable co compounds that will, uh, so it's a biotechnology application. And the idea is you would re-engineer your cyanobacterium. You'll be able to grow it under, with CO2, sunlight, water, cheaply, low cost, uh, in areas that don't compete with crops. Then you can purify your product and then obviously incorporate it into a, an expensive product, hopefully, that you could sell. I mean, we, we've been working on the production of hyaluronic acid, which is, uh, which is used widely in the cosmetic world. Something I'm very, well, I need to use hyaluronic acid probably myself, but it's something, the anti-wrinkle agent, it's, it's, and this is something that, uh, this is something that's showing some promise. So we can get sort of bacteria producing a gram per liter of this hyaluronic acid, which could essentially go into a, 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 a to be used in the cosmetic business. Over here, we've got an example of a sort of bacteria producing fatty acids. So you can see it's a bit turbid because it's producing lots of excreted fatty acids. And you can manipulate these fatty acids to make omega fatty acids, which are very important for a human diet. And so there, and it's about two grams per litre. It's a good yield. It's a good, sizable yield. So it's, it's holding promise. Um, there are some rather more wacky things that we're doing that you wouldn't even dream of doing of thinking about. It's through pure science and, when, and the ability to try things out that you get in the knowledge that maybe leads to some application that were useful for mankind. This is work done by Marin Sauer, um, a biodesigner, and, and she found that she could take cyanobacteria and print them with an inkjet printer onto an electrode surface and shine light onto this essentially printed system and generate a current. So this is where cyanobacteria are taking sunlight and generating a current because at low rate they excrete electrons out of the cell. And so now she's working on um, attempts, she's attempting to incorporate such a solar bio battery, we call it, into printed bioelectronics. So we're trying to merge a living system with a normal a CPU, for instance, to try and drive uh, uh, bio, uh, electronics using sunlight via a um, uh, cyanobacterial cell. Um, and finally, where do I think plant biology is really going to take off in the future? And it comes from my visits to Singapore, and, it's, and, it, and, it, and it relates to the work that uh, was mentioned by the very first speaker, genomics and plant diversity, and the ability to sequence genomes so cheaply and to generate so much sequence data, particularly in the tropics where we know that they have, they produce, these plants produce uh, compounds that may have medical properties, favorable medical properties. We don't know what compounds they make. So at the moment, we're right at this stage, plant diversity, and we're sequencing genomes, and I'm working with some colleagues at NTU where they're, they're attempting to sequence a, a, um, a thousand genomes in Singapore, and you'll get lots and lots of data. But the problem is, and I don't want to downgrade, downgrade the efforts and the, what the, the claims made by the first speaker, but that's just the start. And you ha there has to be a pipeline where you can analyze the sequence data and understand what the enzymes are that are encoded and what products they're making. So we're, you're having to do transcriptomics, look at the proteomes, the, in particular the metabolomes, what are the molecules being produced by these different plants, and ultimately they will have to be, these, end, these genes will, will be expressed, because these are rare and uh, plants, will have to be expressed in a synthetic biology way in a heterologous system like yeast or bacteria. So there's going to be a lot of work directed at generating, generating pipelines where we can re reconfigure metabolism in a simple organism for scale up, to allow uh, people to access these molecules and allow the chemical industry access to these molecules. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. <laughs>
bacteria to also absorb this light? Is it? Gosh, it's like a viva, <laughs> not, not discussion. <laughs> <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> um, well, uh, we do have an expert in the audience. I won't, I won't call Tanai out to uh, talk about it. But it, it's, it's clear it's not all cyanobacteria that make chlorophyll F. And they, they, have a, they, they live in a special niche where the light environment is, is enriched in the far red. So there's been a selectional pressure for them to, to essentially a one-step process. You know, it's an additional reaction. They've discovered a way of converting chlorophyll A to chlorophyll F, and thereby allow them to thrive in this far red enriched environment. Um, obviously, plants aren't under the same constraints. But um, plants will be, um, depending where they are in the in, in, in what part of the plant, as you go down the canopy, obviously the light becomes more and more red enriched. So there will be elements in the lower, lower regions of the canopy where, where they will benefit from having access to that part of the spectrum, but obviously it wasn't, it wasn't necessary for plants to thrive and, and to produce seed and so on. Oh, but you. for producing crops, more crops, more biomass, it would be a helpful, it would be a helpful addition. And um, the second question is with the immunity. And I was just so struck by the chloroplasts and the nets they were forming and you know, the fact that they can also somehow help with the immune response. And it struck me because recently you see the same thing with mitochondria. Mitochondria get activated and they also do similar form networks, things for yeah. networks, exactly. Um, and they're also organelles inside cells and similarly, they were also they bacteria. Their own genomes, yeah. yeah, their own genomes. Um, I was just wondering if there are any links. Did you also see the mitochondria behaving the same way or is there a preference in plants? So we also had a quick look at the mitochondria. We could see that they also accumulate at mm -hmm. the interface. So they are probably, they are also contributing. We haven't uh, monitored them uh, intensively, so we don't know if they also form networks in response to, uh, to pathogen infection. But yeah, for chloroplasts, it's uh, clear that we also, we have a collaborator who is working on early branching land plants. These are Marcantia liverworts, which basically diversify from the plant lineages 500 million years ago, and they, they have the same response. Oh, wow. So it looks like that is a really ancient uh, response. Okay. We don't know whether if, if it dates back to the first cells that acquired the chloroplasts, but looks like at least the liverworts, which diversed uh, 500 million years ago, they, they have yeah. the same response. So it's very interesting. I guess there are also um, aspects to our own immunity. The, um, the, 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 uh, some algae produce hydrogen, uh, and they have a hydrogenase. You need a hydrogenase en enzyme to catalyze that reaction. So plants don't have a hydrogenase, uh, and it's quite complicated to, to assemble a hydrogenase. You need many accessory factors. But the al green algae do, do produce hydrogen, and there was a lot of interest in, 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 in exploiting that, that property. Uh, the downside is, uh, is that if you're going to use photosynthesis to drive the hydrogenase, and you, you couple it to the light reactions, you're producing oxygen from photosystem two, <laughs> but the hydrogenase is sensitive to oxygen. So it essentially becomes inhibited very, very rapidly. So there were lots of attempts to, and normally the hydrogenase works nighttime when there's no, there's no um, light reactions ongoing. So there have been a lot of attempts to try and play around with the oxygen conditions in the cell so that you can just get uh, sufficient electrons going through, not producing the, uh, sufficient oxygen to inhibit the hydrogenase. And, and, it, and there are, it, it's working, but not to the level you would need to make it a viable option for producing a, a hydrogen fuel, I'm afraid. Thank you. Yeah. And I comment that people have thought about making hybrid chemical systems where you can electrochemically make hydrogen and then use the hydrogen to feed bacteria which will live on hydrogen, and that might be more efficient than a purely biological system. Yeah, that's a very good question, and uh, so we often discuss this in the plant uh, microbe interaction conferences we have, and we recently had this discussion in Barcelona. So uh, what is genetic modification? We discuss is there are different types of genetic modifications, right? So especially all of you today, without knowingly, you ate uh, genetically modified plants. But these are not like at the level of, 
we precisely genome edit them. This is through classical breeding. Many of the foods we have now access to is basically we artificially breed them. Sometimes this process involves uh, using chemicals or ionizing radiation to, to mutate the plants, and then you back cross them to the original, the, the wild uh, parents, and then from the offspring you select the best looking plant which produces the more sugar, bigger plant, more yields, and so on. This has been going on for a long time, so all the most of the foods we have in our markets is through this classical breeding, and this is uh, accepted by the EU Commission that this typical classical breeding is fine because we have been using it for a long time and that is not causing any harm. So that is fine. But when it comes to the genome editing, where we precisely modify a gene, that we know which gene we are targeting because the other approach is kind of shotgun approach. You randomly mut mutagenize genes and you select for the best trait. But in this case, we can do a genome editing at the precise level. We know what we are modifying. But this is, at the moment, is not accepted. So you can consider which one is better, like whether this random approach of uh, doing it. It looks like it is fine because we have been uh, using this technology for uh, more than 50 years, and that is working quite well. But this is a new technology like we have in our hands, but somehow, I mean, there is a really public or general uh, uh, view against, against their usage. But uh, as we have seen, we need to produce much more food, and soon we will have a food crisis. We already have a food crisis. And to be able to cope with that, we need to be open to new technologies. And one thing that we should ensure that when we have these technologies, when we use them, we have proper labeling of our products, and people can choose which one they want to consume. So I think people have thought about multi-cropping and canopy modification is a thing. Um, because natural plants are evolved to be robust, not productive. Um, and in terms of using all of the light, so this chlorophyll F, there is an actually, there's another modified chlorophyll, chlorophyll D. Um, cyanobacteria have light harvesting structures that will harvest all of the light. So a dense culture of cyanobacteria looks black because it has all of the lights being absorbed. Uh, Peter, do you have a comment? On canopies? Or? Um, the, the, yes, of course. If you, if you, you can, people are working. It's not my area, but people are working on re-engineering the, the canopy structure to maximise to stop self shading and so on. That's one, that's one way. I guess the but, other. But, oh, sorry. But the other, the other issue is, is it's all about sync source relationships. You can you can upregulate photosynthesis, but does that necessarily mean that you will produce more seed? And that's something that has to be considered. I was, just, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say another benefit is you're increasing biodiversity there. Yeah. So, you know, with the pathogen, that really nice picture you had up where a lot of the crops die as soon as one pathogen comes and kills all of them, you might not have the same problem. Yeah, so most of the IPCC, I would say I'm not a big expert on climate, but as I understand it, most of their pathways assume BECs, and it's quite, it's hidden in the fine print uh, that we will need carbon negative technologies. So I think biofuels, I think, are a non-starter because then it's not even clear that they're energy positive. We need to grow lots of food anyway, so we can't really afford to spend time on biofuels. BEX is even less efficient because you have to spend energy putting the carbon into the ground. So I'm not an expert on carbon capture and storage, but I think that also has huge energy losses. So if you have a biofuel that's already very, very marginal, it becomes unfeasible to do BEX. And even optimistic measurements of BEX say things like, you need to cover all of India with forest to have any sort of effect on the climate. So it's sort of a sort of scale deployment of, of BEX technology. So I think from my point of view, it's a fantasy, although I think there's lots of, lots of people are very invested in it. Uh, so it's very popular, so you, know, you rarely see negative comments about it. <laughs> so I just wanted to provide a bit of a counterpoint in my talk uh, to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.
you all for coming and really hope you enjoyed the debate and we'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.